In 43 states, the government issues licenses to carry based on objective criteria. But in six states, including New York, the government further conditions issuance of a license to carry on a citizen's showing of some additional special need. Because the state of New York issues public carry licenses only when an applicant demonstrates a special need for self-defense, we conclude that the state's licensing regime violates the Constitution. <laughs> Special thanks to my friend Braden Langley over at Langley Outdoors Academy for that narration. I asked if I could use that. It was from his video, and he, of course, said yes. So make sure that you subscribe to see all the new videos that Braden can come up with. I was originally going to animate Clarence on screen, but I decided that when I got into After Effects that it was looking kind of bad, as in a not-so-good-for-the-channel type of thing, so I decided that we would just use a distinguished screenshot of the man. It, it was easier on the, end, the editing anyway. Rather than running out as soon as it was announced and saying, hey, it's a good thing, hey, it's to hear, you know, all that sort of stuff, I took some time to actually read the document to be able to tell you basically what's in it. Now, by saying that I read it, things like a hundred and some pages, what I read of it was the section that Clarence Thomas wrote. There are a couple concurrent opinions and a dissenting opinion that I have not read yet, but I've read the main opinion and I think that I can basically give you what the thing says. But again, I do reserve the right to change what I'm going to say once I've read those concurrent opinions. But I wanted to take some time and actually read it before I told you what, it, what was in it or what it was all about. Now, I have some notes that I'm going to follow to make sure that I hit all the points that I wanted to hit that I took while reading it. But before we do that, we're gonna, of course, pay the bills. Arms Directory is a 2A dedicated social network. The team at Arms Directory have all made their names inside the industry and draw from a wealth of experience. We're talking everything from design and manufacturing to marketing. So they know the firearms business firsthand. The objective of the project is to ensure that the first and second amendments have a place without sensorial oversight. Special thanks to them for making today's video possible. Now, before we get going to my notes, I will have the full text linked in the description box down below so that you guys can go read it for yourself. I do suggest reading it for yourself. You may have to break it up into pieces that are digestible because again, it is in legalese because it's written by lawyers. If you look here, these are basically one-liners. So I may have some cuts in here where I collect myself and figure out what it is exactly I wanted to say before continuing on to the next one. So first and foremost, Number one, New York's law on concealed carry permit issuance is unconstitutional. And I don't need to build that out too much because I think the rest of these points are going to go ahead and do that for us. But number two, and it is definitively stated in the decision, you have a right to carry a handgun outside the home for self-defense. The third point that I have here is actually echoed multiple times throughout the decision. There's a, a couple places at the beginning, and then there's uh, some spots in the center, and there's some spots towards the end. But the history of gun control is inherently racist in its origin. Or your leaders are really into gun control. You might wonder about their motivations, because I'm just going to throw it out there, that if you look at the history of gun control, well... Most of those provisions have their basis in trying to disenfranchise a particular group. Not always the same group. Uh, point four, and this goes back to the heart of number one, why it's unconstitutional. This definitively states that may issue states. So you've got the vast majority of states that have uh, concealed carry laws are shall issue states. Ohio here is a shall issue state. It's also a constitutional carry state, but as far as the concealed weapons permits are concerned, it is a shall issue state. Places like New York, California, New Jersey, those are, or excuse me, were, past tense, may issue states. No longer. They are all now shall issue states. Number five, and this one's really important. This is what I was really hoping that they were going to do. And you've seen this said on a whole bunch of different things, but there are different levels of scrutiny that are applied to different 
issues when looking at constitutional uh, discrepancies when the legislature has written a law and then it's try it's been tried to enforce and then it comes to the courts and the court has to use different levels of scrutiny for different things to determine if they're constitutionally uh, allowed or not. Now, when it comes to an enumerated right, like the Second Amendment, for instance, uh, the old rules of scrutiny that they have been using at the appellant court level, the what they call the two-step approach, is invalid. The Supreme Court has now said, you are not allowed to do that anymore. Is this Second Amendment conduct? If it's Second Amendment conduct, sorry, you, you can't. You can't infringe on it, is what it comes down to. That is, by itself, enough to basically say, hey, you can't do that. And what they're using to determine whether it is constitutional conduct is whether or not it is historically evidenced that things have been done in the past, and by the past, as in the history, I mean in a particular period of time, uh, where there are regulations in place for these types of things at or around the time that the document was written, basically. And we'll get into that a little bit more. The sixth point that I have written down here, I wrote down because I was actually laughing about something that I read in the decision. I think that Clarence took a shot at the legislature and basically called them incompetent, which I thought was fantastic because they totally are. <laughs> but basically, uh, the legislature's job is to have an idea of the constitutionality of something and try to work around the framework that they've been given. And a lot of times, basically, they don't know what they don't know. And it's the court's job to determine whether or not they were off base. Well, the, what that comes down to is that in the past, there's been kind of this collaboration between the appellant court and the legislature, where the appellate court's like, hey, you guys made a law. Why did you make this law? And what was the basis for it? And then based on those answers, the appellate court will decide whether or not that was a good enough idea. And if that doesn't work out, then they move it up the court system, is basically how, the, how it's been done up to this point. The Supreme Court basically says, hey, again... Y'all been doing it wrong. That's not the way that you should be doing it. And here's your instructions on how to do it. The seventh point that I've written down here is actually me reading between the lines a little bit. This was not expressly stated, but there were multiple times in the decision where I think it could be argued that evidence has been provided that uh, bans of any kind are unconstitutional. So uh, we'll get to kind of what this all means towards my wrap up of this. But I think that if you read the decision, you'll see that there are multiple places where it's like, Hey, yeah, you know, you, you, you can't permanently ban that. My eighth point that I have written here, it states that the second amendment exists for all lawful purposes, it does not define what those lawful purposes are. It just says that the second amendment is for all lawful purposes. It also says verbatim in a few places that <laughs> the technology is not locked when the as to when the document was written that the founders had sufficient foresight to see that technology would advance and therefore the technology of today is protected by the second amendment this one's actually a little bit negative there are limitations as to where a person can carry. There is historical precedent that there are certain sensitive locations that the government has the power to restrict carry to. Now, I'm not super happy about that. It goes on to say that, for instance, again, verbatim in the decision, that you can't just declare the island of Manhattan a sensitive location. <laughs> what they're going for are things like courthouses, the 10th point, uh, public carry was common up until just a little bit ago. And 
that uh, not only was it common, but it was acceptable in public and encouraged. And when the document was written, that was the case, and therefore it is protected now. And then my last point that I wrote down based on the kind of closing analysis by Clarence was that the history is clear that the Second Amendment is not subject to standards that other rights are not. So you, the Second Amendment, I believe he said, is not a second-class right. And therefore, the way that this has been handled in the past is unacceptable. And basically what they've done with this decision is remanded it back to the lower courts for them to fix their decisions. So really... What I'm going to say now is, what does this all mean? Well, immediately, I'm going to say nothing. As in, right this second, it means nothing. The courts now have to take this guidance from the Supreme Court and then act on it. Business as usual at the appellant courts is over. So that means they have to completely redo everything that they've done up to this point as far as how they've been using scrutiny. And they have to use the new, the historical standards essentially set out in the Heller decision. And they basically ignored all the scrutiny stuff saying you can't do that basically anymore uh, when it comes to Second Amendment issues. Now, the time frame that we're talking about as far as that historical precedent is concerned, the most applicable time frame for uh, courts to use precedent from is going to be the period just before the formation of the Union up until the period just before the Civil War, approximately. Those are going to be the core cases, the core precedents that are going to be used for historical uh, analysis of a given provision. Now, in my opinion, I think that there are really two points that are kind of left open for questions from this decision. And you got to remember that the way this happens, basically, is that the legislature abuses its power. It puts out a regulation, and then the law enforcement enforces the law, and then persons are damaged. They obtain standing in court, and then they sue, and it moves through the appellant courts with the lawsuits. And then if those courts abuse their power then they find themselves up to the Supreme Court. Generally speaking, the Supreme Court doesn't take cases if it doesn't think that it has anything to add, meaning they basically, you know, they just decline to hear it, and by declining to hear it, they say, yeah, we sort of agree with what you guys said at the lower court. Usually they only take the, the case when they have something to add to it. So... The things that I think are left open to interpretation that we're going to see that potentially could be abused here are dangerous and unusual. We see this language in a lot of Second Amendment regulations. What does that mean? So I would argue that dangerous or unusual would be like sarin nerve gas. That would be dangerous and unusual. Nuclear weapons, dangerous and unusual. I would not say that machine guns, for instance, are dangerous and unusual. There are millions upon millions of machine guns on this planet used across the globe. I don't think that that is dangerous or unusual by any stretch of the imagination. The, the other side of that coin that I think is really important is it can't just be unusual because you banned it unconstitutionally. Of course it's unusual if it doesn't exist here because you banned it. So the question is uh, silencers, for instance. You could argue that in non-free states that those are unusual there because they've been banned. I don't think that I, I, I don't think that that stands up to the scrutiny as far as as far as uniform application of logic is concerned. So I'm really interested to see where that goes. You know what I'm just gonna say it because I don't think there's a way I can say this without pissing somebody off. So sorry if this is you. but I think that the case for federal disability due to felonious activity is up for debate. If you look at the way that the decision was written, it references on more than one occasion that people's 
rights, by and large, were not permanently taken from them after they committed a crime. Basically, you, you did the crime, you did the time, you paid your fine, and the government gave you your guns back. I would say that they would have to go back and find a historical precedent from the time frame that we discussed where guns were permanently removed. People's rights were permanently prohibited from them. And I have said this on multiple occasions, but I'm of the mind that if you've committed a crime and you've paid your debt to society, if the government has adjudicated you fit to be back on the street, then why are you not completely whole? Why are you a partial citizen without the right to vote and without the right to protect yourself and various other things? If the government has determined that you are fit to be back on the street, then I think that you are fit to be back on the street completely. And if you're not fit to be back on the street, as in you're not fit to have all of your rights restored, then why the hell are you walking around as a free person? I think somebody's going to challenge that. And I think that's probably the next one that we might be looking at. That whole uh, federally prohibited persons thing may be a thing, particularly given the uh, the state of affairs in, co- in the country right now with all the uh, usurpations of power uh, that are moving through Congress right now. It might be interesting to see where that goes. It'd be nice if that just undercut the whole thing, but I don't think that's going to happen. Anyway, guys, that's all I got. It's exceptionally hot in here. I don't know what the heck. <laughs> it's usually really cool in here, but it was absolutely scorching outside today. So I guess I just need to leave the vault door open and let it cool off in here a little bit. I've also expelled a lot of hot air. I'd like to know what you guys think, particularly if you've read the decision farther than I have and I've missed something. But I look forward to the vigorous discussion down below. And special thanks to our patrons on Patreon that make videos like this one possible. You should see some of their names on screen right now.